We're going to have a brief lecture and conversation about Maud Kearney, the well-known Limerick uh, lace maker. And I'm joined by Randall Hutkinson, who is a cousin of Maud Kearney, who was, of course, a member of the Hutkinson family. So I think before I get started talking about, about Maud herself, I think I, I, I call upon Randall just to say a few words about her family background. Okay, um, well, as you can tell from the name, we're not a Limerick family. Uh, my great grandfather uh, was born in Manchester and he studied ecclesiastical decoration under the famous uh, church architect Fugin. And he joined a company called Hardman's in, in, they were based in Birmingham, and they would have been one of the kind of main church decorators in England at the time. And at that same time, there was a lot of church building going on in Ireland. In fact, between 1830 and 1930, there were 3,000 churches built in Ireland and 26 cathedrals. So he was been sent over to Ireland all the time to do the work in the churches here, and he saw the opportunities here, and he decided to move Lock, Stock and Barrel to Ireland in 1862, I think it was. And he had got married in Manchester, and he had, he, they had um, one son, so he was five when they came over. And they based first down in Cork, and they, he, he ran his business from Cork. He worked all over the country. But unfortunately, in the intervening years, both his wife died and his son died from ailments at the time, you know, whether it was TB or whatever. And, um, in 1872, he met what would be my great grandmother, Delia Kennedy. Her father had a drapery shop on McConnell Street, which was George Street back then. And they got married on the 11th of January in 1873, which is 150 years ago now. And they set up their home at 54 Henry Street, which is where we're still living today. So we're 150 years in that house now. Uh, Maud was born in October of that year, uh, the 3rd of October, so her anniversary is 150 years this October. And she, um, so she was the eldest of six children that were born to my great grandparents. And uh, my great grandmother then, Delia, unfortunately, she had health problems too within major years. And, well, actually, in, when she was still quite young. And she died in 1888 when Maud was only 15. And again, it was, it was complications due to um, a premature birth where um, she died from bleeding, really, I think. It was. And uh, so Maud was, was the eldest at 15, and there were five other children's children, aged down to an infant, the new foreign infant. So, you can imagine Maud took on the, the role probably of a mother. Now, they did have a nanny in the house as well at the time to help out. But I'd say that that's kind of where she got her. Uh, and the industrious kind of looking after a household, you know, and I suppose the fact that she was going to become very independent herself. And she was also helping out my, my great grandfather with the business as well because she, she was brilliant at art. So she used to be drawing out the designs for the home and drawing out the, the um, patterns and that for the steps of the churches. So she went to Lord Hill School and when she began to she went to the Crawford School of Art down in Cork where she studied art and design and lace making. And after uh, completing her studies down there, they offered her a job in the school. So she, she was working in the school down there then. And, but again, her kind of entrepreneurial side was coming out, so she started giving classes on the side at night time in different places and all around Munster, and she was uh, giving classes on weekends and that. And, and um, once the school heard about this, they more or less fired her from the job because they wanted her to just concentrate on the school alone. So 
they, she got on so well with all the students that they all more or less went out on strike and signed a petition and wanted her reinstated in the school and the management had to give her back her job and so she continued in the job for another few years and um, she got married then in 1904 I think she was uh, 31 at that age at that time and um, she married a man called Eugene Carney who was an auctioneer in town uh, his family had um, a biscuit making factory down on Charlotte Key. If any of you remember Geary's biscuit mm -hmm. yes. factory, they, Geary's actually bought out Carney's in later years. But um, it was a big, big enterprise, you know. And um, so she married him, and around the same time, she set up her own um, lace making business because now she had given up the job in, in Cork and, and um, she just was a person who wanted to do things all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, they lived in Tolman and Gate in a house that's gone now, Riverside House. It was right on the edge of the river, along where O'Dwyer Villa lives now. And a um, big, very big house, um, kind of, it was two story, but a long house. And it, it had a big bay window over in the river. It was part of an old distillery at one stage. And uh, so she set up her lace making business there. She was bringing ladies in there to do the lace making in that big room with the bay window over up in the river because there was so much light. It was, it was very good for doing that type of work. But she also had people working from their own homes as well. And, and uh, they were making uh, like a kind of cottage industry. So she did a number of people working for her over the years. And um, she, as well as this, she, she actually had six children while she was running this business. So she was she's an amazing yes, person, yes. really, you know. Yeah. And not only that, like, I mean, she, she used to, she was, in our family, she has a fantastic reputation because she was always helping other members of the family out if they were in any trouble or distress or, you know, financial problems or anything. And um, even at one stage, my grandfather, who had taken over the business from from James, from Maud's father. Um, he got lead poisoning from the paint and he couldn't work for over a year, I think. And Maud took over the business at that stage while she was running her own business. She ran the ecclesiastical decorating business as well. And he had to go away to recuperate in a place over in England to one of these kind of health spas and he spent months and months over the winter. But he was five after it, he got over it all okay. And um, so, yeah, Maud had, had six children. She, she moved to Dublin around 1926. Um, I don't know why, they, they, it was just maybe a change of, of um, lifestyle or whatever. But she continued running the business based here in Limerick. And she'd be coming up and down the whole time. And she'd stay in her house up in, in Henry Street when she was down. Her husband died again, young enough to in 1934 and at that stage she had started dabbling in property as well in, in Dublin so she was, she was buying property and it was only recently when we knew that she had done this but we actually found a diary of hers recently where she had all the different properties she was buying and then she'd list what um, workmen she had to get in, how much it was costing, put a new bathroom in, put, get new windows, whatever, new room and then she'd sell the property on and make money on it. And she did this with several properties. And I, I've looked up the properties there recently that are listed in the book, and I thought that they'd be worth a hell of a lot of money. They hadn't done it. They were buying houses. But yeah, so she, she was really um, ahead of her time. And even uh, when she was here in Limerick, before she moved to Dublin, she bought a sports car. Uh, an American sports car, it was just a two-seater car, which really was so rare in Limerick that to have an actual woman driving a sports car yeah. in yeah. the 1920s and 1930s was just amazing. And she, apparently she absolutely adored this car and fly around with it. We have some pictures of it too. Um, so yeah, she continued with the business while she was in Dublin and then done her little bit of property development too. And, uh, Raised, raised the children in Dublin and um, she had done very well for herself and, and uh, she looked after all the children I think 
of the ball at our seat and um, constantly working, constantly doing the lace. She loved the lace work and taught her own daughters all the skills and sewing and all. And it's been passed down to uh, her granddaughter of hers now who, who's donated the collection here to the museum. And she became well known in her own right for um, for needlework, for it was kind of quilt work she's been doing and her stuff is on display all over the world in, like in, in, in a lot of these big buildings in New York and that mm -hmm. they have all these stuff on display. I think she's coming down in December, she's going to give a talk about, about Maud and its work. Um, she, yeah, she travelled an awful lot too, promoting the lace work, travelled to the USA um, we have pictures of her over there, details of her travelling over by boat and trying to promote Plymouth Lace. Um, she went to Europe as well promoting it. She bought an awful lot of the the basis for the lace, the the, the necks, is it? Yeah, the, I'm, I'm not too yes, open it myself, but she used to travel to Brussels to buy them and she'd get the finest of, of um, lace and or, or material, whatever was needed. Um, we have even again, Pat Brown was doing this year. She found loads of brochures from Brussels, and again, she was <coughs> things like she went to, to, to Germany in 1936, and it turned out the Olympics were on there at the time. So she went to the Olympics in 1936 and picked up all the brochures, which we still have at home now as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we so, we can not be party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> You see, at, at the time, it's plastic and round. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so it's, it, she seems to have an amazing life, but a very modest person. And um, I mean, it's only in recent years that we've learned more about her and, and everything she did. And uh, I mean, we have pictures of her in Milan in her 80s, you know, visiting Milan and traveling around there. And um, she. She died in 1963, actually. She was just three days over her 90th birthday. So the 10th of October, 1963, she died. Mm -hmm. but, um, yes, uh, so an amazing woman and just very uh, touching in her life. But, uh, you know, yeah, so um, I, I, don't, I can't go into the, the different types of lace work because I don't know enough about that. But uh, it's just the, the kind of personal Details and said it. Yeah. Our family for years, and when my sister was younger, she decided she'd cut it up and make pieces on a collar for herself. So we had nothing then for years until Ronya and Maud's granddaughter gave me a few pieces there recently. So I'm delighted to have that. Yeah. And even the, the collection that has been donated to the museum here. They're all labelled because she used to travel with um, these little leather suitcases full of the lace and she'd have a little label to tone the lace industry on it. And even some of them are priced as well, like in oh, the old money. Mm -hmm. So hopefully some of them will be on display okay. yes. like yes. and uh, There's some beautiful pieces, there's some wedding veils, you know, that you you think were for royal weddings, like, you know, and that. And, yeah. There's also a beautiful fan, um, a lace fan that, that Ronnie has held on to because it commemorates the 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 first born of Maud's children who died when she was only nine. Mm -hmm. And Maud made this fan with her name and the date and that on it, you know. But I think it will go on display. I think she's bringing it down to the display in, in December. Yeah, so. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. Granddaughter of um, Maud Kearney and cousin of um, Randall's has donated the uh, Maud Kearney lace collection to the museum. And we're going to have an exhibition here in this very room in December to mark the occasion. And it'll, be, it'll also be marked by the formal handing over Alter collection by Ronya to the museum. And what that has resulted in now is that um, we already had a fine collection of Limerick Lace, and then in 2019 we acquired a long term loan, the collection of um, Florence B. O'Brien, which was also donated by her granddaughter, um, Veronica Rowe. 
So at this stage, I think it's fair to say that we probably have one of the largest, certainly, if not the largest collections of hemorrhage lace in existence. I, I, I hesitate to say definitely because one never knows it could be a private collection somewhere. Um, but certainly we have one of the largest collections of limerick delays in existence and um, I suppose just a few general comments then about the um, about the, um, the, the, the period. It, it was interesting how limerick delays produced so many strong and um, uh, energetic and able uh, women. Uh, when we think at, the, at that period there was both Florence Spear O'Brien, who was slightly older than, um, than Maud Carney, there was Maud Carney herself. And then, of course, there would also have been the likes of Lady Aberdeen, who was a great promoter of Irish arts and crafts in the same period, the late 19th, early 20th century. And um, she was um, particularly interested in Limerick Lace. And in 1907, she had a ball in Dublin Castle, which everybody had to wear um, lace, and she herself appeared wearing um, limerick lace. So it's interesting that it was over a hundred years ago, there were so many uh, female entrepreneurs uh, working to promote Irish arts and crafts. And I think Maud Carney was definitely one of the most outstanding of those figures because there were a lot of different lace industries in Ireland in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Um, but many of them petered out very quickly because what happened was there was a sort of a lace bubble in that there was um, a lot of grand aid available, particularly from the congested districts board. And this resulted in lace industries being set up all over the place. And frequently they, um, they were not particularly well run and they collapsed more or less after independence, in or around independence, because of course grant aid wasn't available anymore. But if you look at Maud Carney's um, um, enterprise, it lasted for 50 years. And at its height, it employed, I think, between 50 and 80, yeah. you know, and it wasn't uh, at all dependent on grant aid. So I think we could say that Limerick Lace probably had among the most um, able and enterprising uh, women uh, promoting it and organising it. And, and of course, another thing, she was a tremendous person, model as well, was she for the marketing of, of the lace. Yeah. And this was something that Lady Aberdeen was very interested in as well, uh, that Irish arts and crafts should be marketed um, internationally. Uh, uh, because obviously, it was one thing to have uh, producers of lace, but then it had to be actually sold. And, um, and of course, then another interesting point that, that um, that uh, Randall made there is that it was mainly the English speaking world, of course, Limerick Lace sold because the continent of Europe had its own very uh, large and well established lace industries, particularly in France and in Belgium and so on. Um, so it was the Irish diaspora really um, that actually were the largest, um, among the largest um, customers for Limerick Lace um, in North America, in Australia, in New Zealand and of course in Britain itself. So I just want to thank Randall very, very much for coming here today. Um, to, I think it's, it's a, it was a far more richer um, event because uh, Randall obviously has a great deal more knowledge of, um, of Maud and of course of family background than, than I obviously have. So I just want to thank him very much for coming. <laughs>